The Homecoming by Ray Bradbury Here they come, said Cece, lying there flat in her bed. Where are they? cried Timothy from the doorway. Some of them are over Europe, some over Asia, some of them over the islands. Some over South America, said Cece, her eyes closed, the lashes long, brown, and quivering. Timothy came forward upon the bare plankings of the upstairs room. Who are they? Uncle Einar and Uncle Fry, and there's Cousin William, and I see Frulda and Helgar and Aunt Morgiana, and Cousin Vivian, and I see Uncle Johan. They're all coming fast. Are they up in the sky? cried Timothy, his little gray eyes flashing. Standing by the bed, he looked no more than his fourteen years. The wind blew outside. The house was dark and lit only by starlight. They're coming through the air and traveling along the ground in many forms, said Cece in her sleeping. She did not move on the bed. She thought inward on herself and told what she saw. I see a wolf-like thing coming over a dark river, at the shallows, just above a waterfall, the starlight shining up his pelt. I see a brown oak leaf blowing far up in the sky. I see a small bat flying. I see many other things, running through the forest trees and slipping through the highest branches, and they're all coming this way. Will they be here by tomorrow night? Timothy clutched the bedclothes. The spider on his lapel swung like a black pendulum, excitedly dancing. He leaned over his sister. Will they all be here in time for the homecoming? Yes, yes, Timothy, yes, sighed Cece. She stiffened. Ask no more of me. Go away now. Let me travel in the places I like best. Thanks, Cece, he said. Out in the hall he ran to his room. He hurriedly made his bed. He had just awakened a few minutes ago at sunset, and as the first stars had risen he had gone to let his excitement about the party run with Cece. Now she slept so quietly there was not a sound. The spider hung in a silvery lasso about Timothy's slender neck as he washed his face. Just think, Spid, tomorrow night is All Hallows' Eve. He lifted his face and looked into the mirror. His was the only mirror allowed in the house. It was his mother's concession to his illness. Oh, if only he were not so afflicted. He opened his mouth, surveyed the poor, inadequate teeth nature had given him. No more than so many corn kernels, round, soft and pale in his jaws. Some of the high spirit died in him. It was now totally dark and he lit a candle to see by. He felt exhausted. This past week the whole family had lived in the fashion of the old country, sleeping by day, rousting at sunset to move about. There were blue hollows under his eyes. Spid, I'm no good, he said quietly to the little creature. I can't even get used to sleeping days like the others. He took up the candle holder. Oh, to have strong teeth with incisors like steel spikes, or strong hands, even, or a strong mind, even have the power to send one's mind out free as Cece did. But no, he was the imperfect one, the sick one. He was even, he shivered and drew the candle flame closer, afraid of the dark. His brothers snorted at him, Bion and Leonard and Sam. They laughed at him because he slept in a bed. With Cece it was different. Her bed was part of her comfort for the composure necessary to send her mind abroad to hunt. But Timothy, did he sleep in the wonderful polished boxes like the others? He did not. Mother let him have his own bed, his own room, his own mirror. No wonder the family skirted him like a holy man's crucifix. If only the wings would sprout from his shoulder blades. He bared his back, stared at it, and sighed again. No chance. Never. Downstairs were exciting and mysterious sounds. The slithering black crepe going up in all the halls and on the ceilings and doors. The sputter of burning black tapers in the banistered stairwell. Mother's voice high and firm. Father's voice echoing from the damp cellar. Bion walking from outside the old country house lugging vast two-gallon jugs. I've just got to go to the party, Spid, said Timothy. The spider whirled at the end of its silk and Timothy felt alone. He would polish cases, fetch toadstools and spiders, hang crepe, but when the party started he'd be ignored. The less seen or said of the imperfect son the better. All through the house below Laura ran. The homecoming, she shouted gaily, the homecoming, her footsteps everywhere at once. 
Timothy passed Cece's room again, and she was sleeping quietly. Once a month she went below stairs. Always she stayed in bed, lovely Cece. He felt like asking her, Where are you now, Cece? And in who? And what's happening? Are you beyond the hills? And what goes on there? But he went on to Ellen's room instead. Ellen sat at her desk, sorting out many kinds of blonde, red, and black hair, and little scimitars of fingernail gathered from her manicurist job at the Mellon Village Beauty Parlor fifteen miles over. A sturdy mahogany case lay in one corner with her name on it. Go away, she said, not even looking at him. I can't work with you gawking. All Hallows Eve, Ellen, just think, he said, trying to be friendly. Huh. She put some fingernail clippings in a small white sack, labeled them. What can it mean to you? What do you know of it? It'll scare the hell out of you. Go back to bed. His cheeks burned. I'm needed to polish and work and help serve. If you don't go, you'll find a dozen raw oysters in your bed tomorrow, said Ellen matter-of-factly. Goodbye, Timothy. In his anger, rushing downstairs, he bumped into Laura. Watch where you're going, she shrieked from clenched teeth. She swept away. He ran to the open cellar door, smelled the channel of moist, earthy air rising from below. Father? It's about time, Father shouted up the steps. Hurry down or they'll be here before we're ready. Timothy hesitated only long enough to hear the million other sounds in the house. Brothers came and went like trains in a station, talking and arguing. If he stood in one spot long enough, the entire household passed with their pale hands full of things. Leonard with his little black metal case. Samuel with his large, dusty, ebony-bound book under his arm, bearing more black crepe. And Bion, excursioning to the car outside and bringing in many more gallons of liquid. Father stopped polishing to give Timothy a rag and scowl. He thumped the huge mahogany box. Come on, shine this up so we can start on another. Sleep your life away. While waxing the surface, Timothy looked inside. Uncle Einer's a big man, isn't he, Papa? Uh. How big is he? The size of the box will tell you. I was only asking. Seven feet tall? You talk a lot. About nine o'clock, Timothy went out into the October weather. For two hours in the now warm, now cold wind, he walked to the meadows, collecting toadstools and spiders. His heart began to beat with anticipation again. How many relatives had Mother said would come? Seventy? One hundred? He passed a farmhouse. If only you knew what was happening at our house, he said to the glowing windows. He climbed a hill and looked at the town, miles away, settling into sleep. The town hall clock, high and round, white in the distance. Town did not know either. He brought home many jars of toadstools and spiders. In the little chapel below stairs, a brief ceremony was celebrated. It was like all the other rituals over the years, with father chanting the dark lines, mother's beautiful white ivory hands moving in the reverse blessings, and all the children gathered except Cece, who lay upstairs in bed. But Cece was present. He saw her peering, now from Bion's eyes, now from Samuel's, now mother's. And you felt a movement, and now she was in you, fleetingly and gone. Timothy prayed to the Dark One with a tightened stomach. Please, please help me grow up. Help me be like my sisters and brothers. Don't let me be different. If only I could put the hair in the plastic images as Ellen does, or make people fall in love with me as Laura does with people, or read strange books as Sam does, or work in a respected job like Leonard and Bion do, or even raise a family one day as mother and father have done. At midnight a storm hammered the house, lightning struck outside in amazing snow-white bolts. There was a sound of an approaching, probing, sucking tornado funneling and nuzzling the moist night earth. Then the front door blasted half of its hinges, hung stiff and discarded. An in-troop grandmama and grandpapa, all the way from the old country. From then on people arrived each hour. There was a flutter at the side window, a rap on the front porch, a knock at the back. There were fey noises from the cellar. Autumn wind piped down the chimney throat, chanting. Mother filled a large crystal punch bowl with a scarlet fluid poured from the jugs Bion had carried home. Father swept from room to room, lighting more tapers. Laura and Ellen hammered up more wolfsbane, and Timothy stood amidst the wild excitement, no expression to his face, his hands trembling at his sides, gazing now here, now there, banging our doors, laughter, the sound of liquid pouring, darkness, sound or wind, the webbed thunder of wings, the padding of feet, the welcoming bursts of talk at the entrances, the transparent rattlings of casements, the shadows passing, coming, going, wavering. Well, well, and this must be Timothy. What? A chilly hand took his hand, a long hairy face leaned down over him. 
A good lad, a fine lad, said the stranger. Timothy, said his mother, this is Uncle Jason. Hello, Uncle Jason. And over here, mother drifted Uncle Jason away. Uncle Jason peered back at Timothy over his cape shoulder and winked. Timothy stood alone. From off a thousand miles in the candled darkness he heard a high fluting voice. That was Ellen. And my brothers, they are clever. Can you guess their occupations, Aunt Morgiana? I have no idea. They operate the undertaking establishment in town. What? A gasp. Yes, shrill laughter. Isn't that priceless? Timothy stood very still. A pause in the laughter. They bring home sustenance for Mama, Papa, and all of us, said Laura. Except, of course, Timothy. An uneasy silence. Uncle Jason's voice demanded, Well, come now. What about Timothy? Oh, Laura, your tongue, said Mother. Laura went down with it. Timothy shut his eyes. Timothy doesn't, well, doesn't like blood. He's delicate. He'll learn, said Mother. He'll learn, she said very firmly. He's my son, and he'll learn. He's only fourteen. But I was raised on the stuff, said Uncle Jason, his voice passing from one room on into another. The wind played the trees outside like harps. A little rain spattered on the windows, raised on the stuff, passing away into faintness. Timothy bit his lips and opened his eyes. Well, it was all my fault. Mother was showing them into the kitchen now. I tried forcing him. You can't force children. You only make them sick, and then they never get a taste for things. Look at Bion. Now, he was thirteen before he... I understand, murmured Uncle Jason. Timothy will come around. I'm sure he will, said Mother defiantly. Candle flames quivered as shadows crossed and recrossed a dozen musty rooms. Timothy was cold. He smelled the hot tallow in his nostrils, and instinctively he grabbed at a candle and walked with it around and about the house, pretending to straighten the crepe. Timothy! Someone whispered behind a patterned wall, hissing and sizzling and sighing the words. Timothy is afraid of the dark! Leonard's voice. Hateful Leonard. I like the candle, that's all, said Timothy in a reproachful whisper. More lightning, more thunder, cascades of roaring laughter, bangings and clickings and shouts and rustles of clothing. Clammy fog swept through the front door. Out of the fog, settling his wings, stalked a tall man. Uncle Einar! Timothy propelled himself on his thin legs straight through the fog, under the green webbing shadows. He threw himself across Einar's arms. Einar lifted him. You've wings, Timothy! He tossed the boy light as thistles. Wings, Timothy, fly! Faces wheeled under. Darkness rotated. The house blew away. Timothy felt breeze-like. He flapped his arms. Einar's fingers caught and threw him once more to the ceiling. The ceiling rushed down like a charred wall. Fly, Timothy! shouted Einar, loud and deep. Fly with wings! Wings! He felt an exquisite ecstasy in his shoulder blades, as if roots grew, burst to explode, and blossom into new moist membrane. He babbled wild stuff. Again, Einar hurled him high. The autumn wind broke in a tide on the house. Rain crashed down, shaking the beams, causing chandeliers to tilt their enraged candle lights, and the one hundred relatives peered out from every black enchanted room, circling inward all shapes and sizes to where Einar balanced the child like a baton in the roaring spaces. Enough! shouted Einar at last. Timothy, deposited on the floor timbers, exaltedly, exhaustedly fell against Uncle Einar, sobbing happily, Uncle! 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 Was it good flying, eh, Timothy? said Uncle Einar, bending down, patting Timothy's head. Good! Good! It was coming toward dawn. Most had arrived and were ready to bid down for the daylight, sleep motionlessly with no sound until the following sunset, when they would shout out of their mahogany boxes for the revelry. Uncle Einar, followed by dozens of others, moved toward the cellar. Uncle Einar, followed by dozens of others, moved toward the cellar. Mother directed them downward to the crowded row on row of highly polished boxes. Einar, his wings like sea green tarpaulins tented behind him, moved with a curious whistling down the passageway. Where his wings touched, they made a sound of drumheads gently beaten. Upstairs, Timothy lay wearily thinking, trying to like the darkness. There was so much you could do in darkness that people couldn't criticize you for, because they never saw you. He did like the night, but it was a qualified liking. Sometimes there was so much night he cried out in rebellion. In the cellar, mahogany doors sealed downward, drawn in by pale hands. In corners, certain relatives circled three times to lie, head on paws, eyelids shut. The sun rose. There was a sleeping. 
Sunset. The revel exploded like a bat nest, struck full, shrieking out, fluttering, spreading. Box doors banged wide, steps rushed up from the cellar damp, more late guests kicking on front and back portals were admitted. It rained and sodden visitors laid their capes, their water-pelleted hats, their sprinkled veils upon Timothy, who bore them to a closet. The rooms were crowd-packed, the laughter of one cousin, shot from one room, angled off the wall of another, ricocheted, banked, and returned to Timothy's ears from a fourth room, accurate and cynical. A mouse ran across the floor. "'I know you, niece Liebesrauter!' exclaimed father around him, but not to him. The dozens of towering people pressed in against him, elbowed him, ignored him. The mouse spiraled three women's feet and vanished into a corner. Moments later, a beautiful woman rose up out of nothing and stood in the corner, smiling her white smile at them all. Something huddled against the flooded pane of the kitchen window. It sighed and wept and tapped continually, pressed against the glass, but Timothy could make nothing of it. He saw nothing. In imagination, he was outside staring in. The rain was on him, the wind at him, and the taper-dotted darkness inside was inviting. Waltzes were being danced. Tall, thin figures pirouetted to outlandish music. Stars of light flickered off lifted bottles. Small clods of earth crumbled from casks, and a spider fell and went silently, legging over the floor. Timothy shivered. He was inside the house again. Mother was calling to run here, run there, help, serve. Out of the kitchen now, fetch this, fetch that, bring the plates, heap the food, on and on, the party happened. Finally, he turned and slipped away up the stairs. He called softly, Cece, where are you now, Cece? She waited a long time before answering. In the Imperial Valley, she murmured faintly, beside the Salton Sea, near the mud pots and the steam and the quiet. I'm inside a farmer's wife. I'm sitting on a front porch. I can make her move if I want, or do anything or think anything. The sun's going down. What's it like, Cece? You can hear the mud pots hissing, she said slowly, as if speaking in a church. Little gray heads of steam push up the mud like bald men rising in the thick syrup, head first, out in the broiling channels. The gray heads rip like rubber fabric, collapse with noises like wet lips moving, and feathery plumes of steam escape from ripped tissue. And there is a smell of deep sulfurous burning in old time. The dinosaur has been a-broiling here ten million years. Is he done yet, Cece? Yes, he's done. Quite done. Cece's calm sleeper's lip turned up. The languid words fell slowly from her shaping mouth. Inside the woman's skull I am, looking out, watching the sea that does not move and is so quiet it makes you afraid. I sit on the porch and wait for my husband to come home. Occasionally a fish leaps, falls back, starlight edging it. The valley, the sea, the few cars, the wooden porch, my rocking chair, myself, the silence. What now, Cece? I'm getting up from my rocking chair, she said. Yes? I'm walking off the porch toward the mud pots. Planes fly over like primordial birds. Then it is quiet, so quiet. How long will you stay inside her, Cece? Until I've listened and looked and felt enough. Until I've changed her life some way. I'm walking off the porch and along the wooden boards. My feet knock on the planks tiredly. Slowly. And now? Now the sulfur fumes are all around me. I stare at the bubbles as they break in smooth. A bird darts by my temple shrieking. Suddenly I am in the bird and fly away. And as I fly inside my new small glass bead eyes, I see a woman below me on a boardwalk. Take one, two, three steps forward into the mud pots. I hear a sound as of a boulder plunged into molten depths. I keep flying, circle back. I see a white hand like a spider wriggle and disappear into the gray lava pool. The lava seals over. Now I'm flying home. Swift, swift, swift. Something clapped hard against the window. Timothy started. Cece flicked her eyes wide, bright, full, happy, exhilarated. Now I'm home, she said. After a pause, Timothy ventured. The homecoming's on and everybody's here. Then why are you upstairs, she took his hand. Well, ask me, she smiled slyly. Ask me what you came to ask. I didn't come to ask anything, he said. Well, almost nothing. Well, oh, Cece, came from him in one long, rapid flow. I want to do something at the party to make them look at me. Something to make me good as them. Something to make me belong. But there's nothing I can do, and I feel funny, and... Well, I thought you might... 
I might, she said, closing her eyes, smiling inwardly. Stand up straight. Stand very still, he obeyed. Now shut your eyes and blank out your thought. He stood very straight and thought of nothing, or at least thought of thinking nothing. She sighed. Shall we go downstairs now, Timothy? Like a hand into a glove, Cece was within him. Look, everybody! Timothy held the glass of warm red liquid. He held up the glass so that the whole house turned to watch him. Aunts, uncles, cousins, brothers, sisters. He drank it straight down. He jerked a hand at his sister, Laura. He held her gaze, whispering to her in a subtle voice that kept her silent, frozen. He felt tall as the trees as he walked to her. The party now slowed. It waited on all sides of him, watching. From all the room doors, the faces peered. They were not laughing. Mother's face was astonished. Dad looked bewildered, but pleased and getting prouder every instant. He nipped Laura gently over the neck vein. The candle flame swayed drunkenly. The wind climbed around on the roof outside. The relatives stared from all the doors. He popped toadstools into his mouth, swallowed, then beat his arms against his flanks and circled. Look, Uncle Einar, I can fly at last! Beat went his hands up and down, pumped his feet. The faces flashed past him. At the top of the stairs, flapping, he heard his mother cry. Stop, Timothy! Far below. Hey! shouted Timothy, and leaped off the top of the well, thrashing. Halfway down, the wings he thought he owned dissolved. He screamed. Uncle Einar caught him. Timothy flailed whitely in the receiving arms. A voice burst out of his lips, unbidden. This is Cece! This is Cece! Come see me, all of you upstairs, first room on the left! Followed by a long trill of high laughter, Timothy tried to cut it off with his tongue. Everybody was laughing. Einar set him down, running through the crowding blackness as the relatives flowed upstairs towards Cece's room to congratulate her. Timothy banged the front door open. Cece, I hate you! I hate you! By the sycamore tree, in the deep shadow, Timothy spewed out his dinner, sobbed bitterly, and threshed in a pile of autumn leaves. Then he lay still. From his blouse pocket, from the protection of the matchbox he used for his retreat, the spider crawled forth. Spid walked along Timothy's arm. Spit explored up his neck to his ear and climbed in the air to tickle it. Timothy shook his head. Don't, Spid. Don't. The feathery touch of a tentative feeler probing his eardrum set Timothy shivering. Don't, Spid! He sobbed somewhat less. The spider traveled down his cheek, took a station under the boy's nose, looked up into the nostrils as if to seek the brain, and then clambered softly up over the rim of the nose to sit, to squat there peering at Timothy with green gem eyes until Timothy filled with ridiculous laughter. Go away, Spid! Timothy sat up, rustling the leaves. The land was very bright with the moon. In the house he could hear the faint ribaldry as Mirror Mirror was played. Celebrants shouted, dimly muffled as they tried to identify those of themselves whose reflections did not, had not ever appeared in a glass. Timothy! Uncle Einar's wings spread and twitched and came in with a sound like kettle drums. Timothy felt himself plucked up like a thimble and set upon Einar's shoulder. Don't feel badly, nephew Timothy. Each to his own, each in his own way. How much better things are for you, how rich. The world's dead for us. We've seen so much of it, believe me. Life's best to those who live the least of it. It's worth more per ounce, Timothy, remember that. The rest of the black morning, from midnight on, Uncle Einar led him about the house from room to room, weaving and singing. A horde of late arrivals set the entire hilarity off afresh. Great, 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 and a thousand more great, greats. grandmother was there, wrapped in Egyptian cerements. She said not a word, but lay straight as a burnt ironing board against the wall, her eye hollows cupping a distant, wise, silent glimmering. At the breakfast at four in the morning, one thousand odd greats grandmama was stiffly seated at the head of the longest table. The numerous young cousins caroused at the crystal punch bowl, their shiny olive pit eyes, their conical devilish faces and curly bronze hair hovered over the drinking table, their hard, soft, half-girl, half-boy bodies wrestling against each other as they got unpleasantly, sullenly drunk. The wind got higher, the stars burned with fiery intensity, the noises redoubled, the dances quickened, the drinking became more positive. To Timothy there were thousands of things to hear and watch. The many darknesses roiled, bubbled. The many faces passed and repassed. Listen! The party held its breath. Far away the town clock struck its chime, saying six o'clock. The party was ending. In time, to the rhythm of the striking clock, their one hundred voices began to sing songs that were four hundred years old, songs Timothy could not know. Arms twined, circling slowly, they sang. 
and somewhere in the cold distance of morning the town clock finished out its chimes and quieted. Timothy sang. He knew no words, no tune, yet the words and tune came round and high and good, and he gazed at the closed door at the top of the stairs. Thanks, Cece, he whispered. You're forgiven. Then he just relaxed and let the words move, with Cece's voice free from his lips. Goodbyes were said. There was a great rustling. Mother and father stood at the door to shake hands and kiss each departing relative in turn. The sky beyond the open door colored in the east. A cold wind entered, and Timothy felt himself seized and settled in one body after another, felt Cece press him into Uncle Fry's head, so he stared from the wrinkled leather face, then leaped in a flurry of leaves up over the house and awakening hills. Then, loping down a dirt path, he felt his red eyes burning, his fur pelt rhymed with mourning, as inside Cousin William panted through a hollow and dissolved away. Like a pebble in Uncle Einar's mouth, Timothy flew in a webbed thunder, filling the sky, and then he was back for all time in his own body. In the growing dawn, the last few were embracing and crying and thinking how the world was becoming less a place for them. There had been a time when they had met every year, but now decades passed with no reconciliation. Don't forget, someone cried. We meet in Salem in 1970. Salem. Timothy's numbed mind turned the words over. Salem, 1970 and there would be Uncle Fry and a thousand times great-grandmother and her withered sermons, and mother and father and Ellen and Laura and Cece and all the rest. But would he be there? Could he be certain of staying alive until then? With one last withering blast, away they all went. So many scarves, so many fluttery mammals, so many sear leaves, so many whining and cluttering noises, so many midnights and insanities and dreams. Mother shut the door. Laura picked up a broom. No, said Mother, we'll clean tonight. Now we need sleep. And the family vanished down cellar and upstairs. And Timothy moved in the crepe-littered hall, his head down. Passing a party mirror, he saw the pale mortality of his face all cold and trembling. Timothy, said Mother. She came to touch her hand on his face. Son, she said, we love you, remember that. We all love you. No matter how different you are, no matter if you leave us one day. She kissed his cheek. And if and when you die, your bones will lie undisturbed. We'll see to that. You'll lie at ease forever. And I'll come visit every All Hallows' Eve and tuck you in the more secure. The house was silent. Far away the wind went over a hill, with its last cargo of dark bats echoing, chittering. Timothy walked up the steps, one by one, crying to himself all the way.